be seated. Let us pray. Merciful God, who pours out on all who desire it the Spirit of grace, deliver us now as we draw near to you. Deliver us from coldness of heart and wandering of mind. That with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections, we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Pastors, organists, wedding planners, florists, ask anyone who works around weddings, and they will tell you, during an average wedding, something will go wrong. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, something will go wrong. Someone is late. The entire wedding is delayed because someone forgot to bring the wedding license. Young flower girls and, and ring bearers refuse to walk the aisle or they stop and greet every familiar face in the congregation like politicians running for office. Or someone, we all know that someone, who wasn't paying attention at the rehearsal who strides confidently to the wrong place. I've always in explicitly instructed wedding parties that if, if the ring is dropped by anyone, I want to pick it up. Because I have no desire whatsoever to end up on America's funniest videos as the victim of a Three Stooges style head bonk. And everybody goes for the ring. But one of my favorite memories of a wedding mishap occurred several years ago at a wedding I was officiating when a bride couldn't get her vows right. She tried several times, but all she managed to get out was for richer or poor whoop. Poor, 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 poorer. <laughs> I'd like you to know that they have been very fortunate in their marriage because they're both very successful. They didn't have to worry about being poor. Yes, something will go wrong. And the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee recorded by John is no exception. Newlyweds in ancient Israel didn't take a honeymoon. Instead, uh, their families and friends enjoyed a feast that could last up to seven days at the bridegroom's home. Weddings were viewed as actually a, a legal and a social contract. Not much different in our nation today. Once two families agreed upon uh, a marriage, a marriage union, the bride accompanied by a cohort of family and friends would walk from her family's home to the bridegroom's home, where brief vows were exchanged as the start of the wedding feast. And just like a modern wedding reception, the wedding feast in ancient Israel revolved around joyous music, dancing, good food, and good wine. In fact, we have written evidence that many rabbis were known to say, without wine, there is no joy. This, along with the sacred laws of hospitality, required a host to keep pouring the wine at a wedding feast until all the guests had had enough. Kind of dangerous. The fact that Wedding feasts could last up to seven days might help explain why the wine ran out in Cana. Understand, it's not like the groom's family can run down to the local uh, store and pick up a case of wine. And also uh, understand that just as a family today would be mortified to run out of food or wine at a wedding reception, so too for the ancients. And that's why Mary... The, the mother of Jesus, moved with compassion for the family in this social disaster, quietly exerts her influence. She goes to her son, implying intimate personal knowledge that Jesus could do something about this embarrassing situation. And Mary says to Jesus, they have no wine. Now, I, 
I think the, the structure of the dialogue in this text tells us all we need to know already, or already know, I should say. We need to know or already know about mother-son relationships. I think Vance actually picked up on this in his reading. Listen to this conversation unfold. They have no wine. What concern is that to me and you? Mary turns to the servant and says, do whatever he tells you. Do you get this? I suspect many mothers have examined this text and learned from it. Jesus said, what, what do we have to do with this? And Mary just turns and says, do whatever he tells you. Pretty confident that he's going to do it. You know, there are 35 specific recorded miracles of Jesus in Scripture. 35. Actually, there are probably more than that due to the fact that there's some duplication and variation in the differing gospel accounts. Matthew and Luke record 20, and Luke records 18. The gospel of John, however, records only seven, and each is unique to his gospel account, because John isn't interested in putting down mere historic narrative. Instead, he chooses specific accounts of Jesus' miracles, and he arranges them to make a point. He is telling an intricate story with each episode aligned to show the progression of Jesus' mission of redemption. But what is the point of Jesus choosing, listening to Mary and, and, and choosing the changing of water into wine as the first miracle of Jesus? What, why did John choose this one? In a world torn then as much as today with war and hunger and poverty, why would John choose this miracle of Jesus? This scene from daily life is the first one he reports. Many have classified this miracle as one that demonstrates divine extravagance more than one of world-changing or eschatological significance. Even Jesus says, what concern is that to you and me? Perhaps John, painfully aware of the cross upon which Jesus' earthly ministry would end, determines first to teach us something of the joy of life that Jesus desires for us. So much so that as, Mar as Mary's urging, he's drawn to consider a seemingly insignificant miracle as his first public demonstration of sovereign power. Over and above any tremendous act that would point to his hour of glorification, as he put it. I think this is good to consider, given that the world today is not that much different. In a world of tremendous need and strife, let us remember that God truly does desire human joy and abundance whenever and wherever it may be found. It's telling that nowhere in his account does John use the Greek word for miracle. Unlike the modern mind, the people of John's day had no problem with the suspension of natural law. John's point is not miracles, but the redeeming power and mercy and grace of God evident in Jesus. The feast in Cana of Galilee is a window, a foreshadowing which offers a spiritual perspective of what is to come, the celebration of of the eternal, extravagant feast of salvation in the kingdom of God. Jesus is the incarnation of God in human flesh. Jesus doesn't come simply to dispose of sin and death, certainly one of his primary goals and, and calls in life. But he also comes. He also comes to celebrate all that is good of God's creation and human life. He takes on all that life has to offer and redeems.
redeems it. All of it. Jesus' life embodies our life. Born of a human mother. Raised in a carpenter's home. Baptized. Attending weddings. Angry enough to chase money changers out of his father's house. And real enough to ask that his cup of suffering pass by him. Yes, Jesus redeems our humanity. Jesus loved life. He filled his cup to its fullest and then allowed it to be poured out for you and me. Jesus celebrated life. Jesus celebrated people. Wherever he he went, He proclaimed that God was glorified in joy, in abundance, in mercy and compassion. He went to wedding parties. He went to dinner parties. He went to where people were, where people were hurting and diseased and even dead, and He proclaimed life. His power was that of grace that liberated the human heart and soul from the fear of both life sometimes filled with many tragedies as well as death. He liberated us in every way. I believe that Jesus desires that we celebrate His living, reconciling, redeeming presence not only as we worship together here today on on these pews. Very comfortable Jews, considering how the rest of the world worships God. But he also wants us to worship in the experiences that we can celebrate together throughout the week, in the laughter and in the joy that we can attribute to good life and, and friendships and community, in the joy of, of preparing and, and sharing a meal with those who are in need of compassion, even in our own congregation, in the fellowship and learning that takes place in our Bible studies, or when we partner with our missions or our missionaries that we support. And also, also when our new members are invited into the homes of long-time members to be welcomed, and assimilated into the life of our chapel family. Yes, this joyful grace of God evident in Jesus' miracle in Cana doesn't produce mere grape juice. It produces the finest of wines, without which, according to the rabbis of the time, there is no joy. But, you know, I like to think that it's not intoxicating and harmful as, as worldly liquor can become but a light and a spiritually refreshing libation that adds joy to our promised feast in the kingdom that is coming. You know, so often we lock the doors of our hearts and our minds. The story is told of Harry Houdini, who, who used to make the boast that he could escape from any jail. It was a very effective publicity stunt that that served him well. But one old police chief almost got the best of him. He locked Houdini in his newest, most advanced jail cell. And as agreed, the police officer left the cell block. Houdini removed the lockpick wire from the lining of his jacket, and he went to work. But despite his experience and expertise, he, he couldn't get the lock open. In total despair, after quite some time, he just rolled over and against the bars of the cell door, and to his amazement, it opened. The clever old police officer had never locked it. It had been locked only in the mind of the great Houdini. I ask you, could this be a parable of our own lives sometimes? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most liberating news that we've ever heard. That's what 
so often we've locked ourselves behind doors of our own creation. We rush to parties and social events and, and events that, that we think that we can experience things that will certainly make us happy in life. Often, we wonder if there's anything more in this life. Is there something more in this life? Something I'm missing? Something that leads us to ask, Are we truly happy? Sometimes persuaded even that there's no more wine. It's run out. Like our energy, our time, our joy. Friends, God's grace evident in Jesus, however, assures us this is not the case. For Jesus can turn water into wine. Christ can change what is dull, flat, colorless, and tasteless water into rich, satisfying, sweet, and abundant wine. The deep meaning of our Scripture is not the mere changing of water into wine. After all, a good magician might convince us that he or she can do this. Instead, the deeper meaning of this text is the change that Christ can make in a person's life. Your life and my life through faith. Christ can truly change you and me. And that's what God's grace is all about. My friends, if we have any task in our world today, certainly it includes the creating of a community in this chapel and far beyond that lives by the principles of compassion, hospitality, and grace that Jesus displayed in Cana of Galilee. If Christ can turn mere water into wine, then what can He do in the lives of those who truly worship Him, truly adore Him, and truly obey Him? As it's recorded in Scripture, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And it is not of yourselves. It is God's gift. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Amen.